Welcome to the Washington Heights Church Podcast. We're so glad you're here. Each week, we bring you the latest Sunday message filled with God's Word to help strengthen your faith and deepen your walk with Christ. Whether you're tuning in from home, your commute, or anywhere in between, we're thrilled to have you join our community. So grab a cup of coffee, find a cozy spot, and let's get started. So this is a series that we began last week looking at how in a time and in an age and in a culture where there's a lot of opportunity to live with fear on a regular basis, how do we grow our faith? And in the tension between those two things, how does our faith grow larger rather than our fears grow larger? And so today, what I want to do is see beyond what we can see, because many times when we face difficulty in this world, when we're struggling, when we're facing just outright suffering, it can be easy to just see that, and we wonder, well, what else is there in those moments? And there's something that the Apostle Paul experienced that helps us understand there is more than we can see, that we can see beyond what is just right in front of us. I want to begin with a picture of that. This image um, is called an auto stereogram. And I don't know if you've seen these before, but these are the things when you look at it, it doesn't look like anything on the surface, but if you kind of stare at it and maybe kind of let your eyes go a little bit, eventually like a 3D image pops out in that. I think if you stare at that one for a long time, you'll see a cowboy victory over the Packers this afternoon and the final score um, will be up there. But I wonder if this image can serve as what it looks like when we're suffering because there it is. And it doesn't look like anything good. It doesn't look like anything much. It doesn't look like anything, anything that we want to be a part of. But Paul's going to help us understand that even in the middle of that, there are images inside of it. Images that we can see beyond what is just staring us in the face. And so what is it that will allow us to discover that, to see that? And especially in times of struggle, times of difficulty. Because some of the claims that the Apostle Paul makes about his journeying through suffering are, are, are pretty amazing. He says, we do not lose hope. Wow. And a part of me, I go, Paul, how did you do that? We are perplexed, but we are not in despair. And I think we know what it means to be perplexed, right? We're just uncertain, unsure. But how did you not lose hope? And how did you not lose heart? What does Paul see? See, I think we live at a time where this is a struggle for us because we're in a time and in a culture where the idea of karma, you know, in some form or fashion, not always in the strictest religious sense in which it's used in some parts of the world, but there's this idea that, hey, what you put out is what you get back. And so what that means is everything that comes our way in one shape or form, we had it coming. And I would suggest to you, yeah, that's really nice and neat and clean, but the Bible didn't know anything about that, and the Bible does not teach that. The Bible does not teach that, hey, whatever comes your way in some way, shape, or form, you had that coming. The Bible says that this world is broken, and sometimes what that means is that innocent people suffer. Sometimes somebody makes a decision over here, but the ripple effect of that decision affects people who are maybe far away, geographically, relationally, and it's messy. And the Bible also never says that suffering is good. Never encourages us to pursue it. Also doesn't say that God brings it to us. But it does say it happens. So how in a broken world do we overcome that? We also live in a culture where the idea is a secular culture. And by that, it doesn't mean, hey, there's no God and nobody pursues that. We know better than that. But what it means is that in essence, what we view life as being and where our greatest hope is for life and fulfillment and all those things is here and now. And in that kind of a view of the world, any form of suffering doesn't produce anything positive. It can only be negative. Tim Keller, who wrote a book about this, 
um, says this, our Western culture is perhaps the worst in history at helping its members face suffering. In secular culture, the meaning of life is to be free to choose whatever makes you happy in this life. And so, in our secular view, suffering can have no meaning at all. It can't be a chapter in your life story. It is just the interruption or even the end of your story. So how is it that Paul, facing incredible struggle, pain, loss, could say we don't lose hope? What did he see beyond what is often the view that we have in our culture? What can we see beyond what we obviously see when we're struggling? Well, I want to talk about three things today. And the first one is the inevitability of suffering. And I'm going to talk about this one, the shortest, because the Apostle Paul talks about it in the shortest form. And what he basically tells us is it happens in this world. Here's really all he says. Outwardly, we are wasting away. And the image behind that is that everything that we hope and dream and desire in this world is like moving away from us and we're reaching out for it, but it just seems to slip our grasp. And it even refers to us physically. You know, if you're still on the sunny side of 18, your best day is coming because that day when we peak is like an afternoon for an hour or two when we're 18 years old. But after that, it's like this long slide into decline, isn't it? Right? If you're on the dark side of 18, you're not what you used to be. And that's just what happens in this world that we are wasting away. To give you one image of that, there is a football player named Joe Namath, who a long time ago on this playoff weekend, I think we need some football analogies, and he famously said, I can't wait for tomorrow because I get better looking every day. <laughs> and he had a good run, but let me show you a little more recent image of Joe Namath. <laughs> Joe, you ain't what you used to be, buddy, and tomorrow's not going to be very kind to you. And that's what the Apostle Paul says. We're all wasting away. And there's a reality that happens in this life that leads us in that direction. And he goes on to say, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not struck down. That there are so many ways in which he's facing difficulty, but he's not giving into it. Hard pressed, not crushed. Perplexed, not in despair. Persecuted, not abandoned. Struck down and not destroyed. Paul, oh, what did you know? That you could face those things that we all know about in one way or another, no matter who we are. What did you see? And a real theme of this letter is that Paul is writing to people who are really questioning his authority, questioning his integrity, questioning his influence in their life, because one of the things that they were looking at is what we often look at at this world at this time as well, where they said, Paul, you're going through all these difficult things. If God was with you, would you be struggling like you are? I mean, what kind of ways is Paul struggling? He told us about this, tells us a little bit later in this letter. He says, I was imprisoned unjustly. He was beaten. He was tortured. He's been on a couple shipwrecks. He's had people disown him, leave him for dead. And they were looking, you know, based on his circumstances in life saying, hey, if God is with you, shouldn't you have protection? I mean, if God is blessing you and you're on God's path, shouldn't, you know, the road be made flat and shouldn't you kind of live in a little bit of a bubble? And Paul's going to push back on that and say, no, not necessarily. In fact, it can even be validation of what God is doing when we face the inevitability of suffering, but we continue to press through. Secondly, the pattern of suffering. And what Paul does in this section is he shows us this principle of how God works when difficult things happen in a broken world. That there is from crucifixion to resurrection. There is from death to life. And there is from bad to good. And he goes one verse after another showing us and kind of playing off this idea of life and death. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. Do you see death and life? And for him, the picture that he has in his mind, no doubt, is Jesus on a cross, the centerpiece 
of all human history, the event that is a defining moment that looked from the world's perspective like a loss, a defeat, and yet God turned it into victory because God then raised him from the dead. He suffered, but then he rose. And when we put faith in our hope and our trust in Jesus, our story gets woven together with his, and that same sort of pattern unfolds in this life of ours, that there is an inevitability to suffering, but God is at work even in those times, not bringing them, not saying they're good. Sometimes it's really hard and difficult, and yet God can bring good out of it. For we who are alive are always being given over to Jesus' sake, so that his life might be revealed in us. And there's that playoff between life and death. Suffering leads to even a greater life. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. And what he's beginning to help us understand is even the things that he went through have been for the benefit of the people to whom he's writing. That maybe you would not experience what you are if those things had not happened. And so I didn't welcome it. I didn't pursue it. I faced some hard things in this life. And God has even used that in your life. And it's part of what you experience in your journey with him. And it is written, therefore, I have spoken. But since we have the same faith, we all also believe. He's talking about how that movement, that principle of death to life, Now, I might push back at this time, and you might be in that same place going, well, that's great for you, Paul. It's nice that you could figure this stuff out, and you would understand this bigger picture, but those of us who are in the middle of it right now, it just doesn't look all that peachy and everything. It just hurts. Can I suggest to you, Paul didn't instinctively just know this. Paul didn't have this from day one. He learned it. How do you know that? Well, he tells us about something in this very same letter. There's a famous phrase that's referred to as a thorn in the flesh. And I don't know if you ever heard that phrase. What does that mean? It's a metaphor. The flesh is often referring to our bodies. And a thorn, if you've ever had a thorn in your skin, you know that's not good. It hurts. And so when we say a thorn in the flesh, a painful body ailment. You know, there are probably a hundred PhDs that have been written on Paul's thorn in the flesh. And do you know what it is? We don't know. We don't know. It's still a mystery. But we know that he suffered. We know that he struggled. And here's what he said. And I prayed over and over again to God to remove the thorn in the flesh. But he didn't. And then he prayed again, God, remove it. And he didn't. And he prayed again, God, remove it. And he didn't. So Paul was just like us, that when it hurts, and that's what we see in front of us, he went to God and asked God to change it, but God didn't. So what is God doing in that moment? Here's what Paul's takeaway, again, something learned over time, is that God's grace was sufficient for him. Paul says, I learned that. And so when he gives us this principle about things moving from death to life, It is born out of his own personal journey and experiential learning. A pattern of suffering, crucifixion to resurrection, death to life, bad to good. You might ask, well, is there somebody in the last 2,000 years maybe that can help us understand this too? Let me show you a picture of somebody named John Perkins, and I think he can help us. A little more recent. 1960s and 70s. He grew up in a poor situation in the deep south in Mississippi. His parents were sharecroppers. His mother died of starvation when he was just an infant. His dad left the family later on. He was raised primarily by his older brother, Clyde, who went on to become a decorated World War II veteran. And Clyde was his hero and really his mentor until one day Clyde was shot by police and died in John's arms. That experience placed a deep-seated hatred. Hatred, especially toward white folks in the Deep South who had done that. He moves to L.A. a little bit later, and he winds up becoming a follower of Jesus as a part of a small group. And he decides to enter ministry, so he's going to become a pastor. 
And he pastors there for a while, and he's praying to God, you know, God, what do you have for me? And he says, I believe that God was calling me back to rural southern Mississippi to minister in the very place where my heart was broken and my hatred was fueled. So he goes back, and he one day, together with some of the people from his church, they go to a courthouse because they want to post bail to a couple students who were arrested after a protest. And there at the courthouse, he is attacked by a group of people beaten savagely. There's a giant head wound. He passes out and wakes up after hours of being out, and they make him mop up his own blood before they turn him loose. But he says that something happened when he was laying there, recovering, coming to from his wounds. These are his words. An image of Christ on the cross filled my mind. This Jesus knew what I had suffered because he had experienced it all himself. But when he looked at that mob that had lynched him, he didn't hate them. He loved them. He forgave them. It's a profound, mysterious truth. Jesus' concept of love overpowering hate, but I know it's true because it happened to me. On that bed full of bruises and stitches, God made a true in me. He washed my hatred away and filled it with a love for the white man in rural Mississippi. And on the other side of that experience, he went on to have an impact far beyond what he had before. And people from all parts of the culture, both sides of the political aisle, all had respect for this man. Why? Because of what he had gone through and how he came through it. And his impact lasted the rest of his days. There was something that happened in the middle of suffering that changed him and was used for good. What happened to him was not good. But what God could do in a bigger picture through that was good. What does that mean? That with God, there is a purpose in my pain. And that God doesn't bring it. And God never says it's good. But God is so big and so awesome and so strong that he can bring good out of it. And notice what he goes on to say next, that all of this was for your benefit. And so he's seeing that part of it is, even though I struggle, there is a positive aspect of it that goes beyond just me. One more example of somebody more recently, this image up here is a man named Reynolds Price. He was a professor at Duke University teaching literature and he contracted spinal cancer, and he survived the cancer and the operations that came along with it, but he wound up being a quadriplegic. Well, one year, there is a student there who is on his way to a medical degree who also contracts cancer, and the cancer is progressing and not getting any better. And that student says to the professor, how can you basically still follow Jesus when your prayers have not been answered, when it is, didn't turn out you know, as good as it possibly could have. This is what Reynolds Price wrote back to that student in a book called In the Fire. If you survive this ordeal, you're certain to be a far more valuable medical doctor and a far, far more valuable person than you ever would have been otherwise. What did he understand? But there's something about the journey through the difficulty that can change us. And suffering is often hard, but God can even use it to transform. And how does Paul know this? Because he talks about how God raised Jesus from the dead. Now, he's not speaking metaphorically. He's not talking about some spiritual version of resurrection. He's talking about as a matter of historical record, Jesus died on a cross and God raised him from the dead. That's where our hope is. And what that means for us when our stories are woven together with his and we put our hope and trust in him and follow him, what it means is that my greatest struggle can produce great strength and credibility and perspective and everything else that can only come that way. So it's inevitable. There's a pattern to it. But then finally, there's a future of suffering. Because what we experience here and now, this is not the way that it's always going to be. There's another day coming, a day of God's choosing. 
And Paul goes on to talk about our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us a weight of glory. What is he talking about there? This is not talking about us achieving our way into God's good graces. He's actually saying the difficulties that we face are accomplishing something that will heighten the experience of joy beyond that moment. Well, what in the world is he talking about? Let me see if I can illustrate it for you this way. And all analogies fall short, so I just want to tell you that up front. But have you ever had one of these nightmares where you wake up and like your family was bludgeoned and they've been done away with? Now, if you haven't had that, I don't know what that tells you about me and what I'm watching and things like that. I don't know. But I've had that, you know, and you wake up in the middle of the night and your heart is racing and it's very real. But then all of a sudden you, you wake up and you come to the point of realizing, ah, that's not true. And I remember having one of those dreams when my kids were still home. They're big and out of the house now. But, and to think, man, you just want to go hug them, but it's the middle of the night and they wouldn't like that. And so you kind of journey on with that, but you have this sense of relief and this sense of joy. That's not true. We're together and we're going to be okay. And that's exactly what Paul is talking about here. That one day, it's as if we will wake up and all the sad things will become untrue. And the very experience of those things will actually heighten the joy on the other side of that moment. And it's even because of the nightmare that the joy is only exceedingly greater. I don't know if the name Fyodor Dostoevsky means anything to you as a Russian author over 100 years ago. In the Brothers Kazimerov, he has this scene, and I think he's talking about the same image, the same idea. He says, I believe that all suffering will be healed and will be made up for, that all the humiliating absurdity of human contradictions will vanish like a pitiful mirage. In the world's finale, at the moment of eternal harmony, something so precious will pass. It will suffice for all hearts, for the comforting of all resentments, for the atonement of the crimes of humanity, all the blood that they've shed. This thing will not only make it possible to forgive, but to justify everything that's happened. That it's not as if the experience of difficulty will somehow be erased. We'll even see how that makes the experience of joy and togetherness with God all the better. J.R.R. Tolkien, Lord of the Rings author. I don't know if you know any of his story apart from his stories, but he had a difficult life. His mother died when he was young. His father died when he was 12. All of his friends except for one died in World War I. And he referred to a hope beyond the walls of the world because somebody like that could get very jaded about life and how hard it is. And his stories are full of darkness and orcs and all kinds of things that are dark, but it is also infused with a hope that is relentless and ultimately prevails. And when you read his story through that lens, it makes a lot of sense. Here's one statement out of the Lord of the Rings. The minstrel sang to them until their hearts, wounded with sweet words, overflowed. And their joy was like swords, and they passed on and thought out to regions where pain and delight finally flow together, and the tears are the very wine of blessedness. What did he know? He knew what the Apostle Paul knew. He knew 2 Corinthians 4. He knew that it's inevitable, but he knew there's a pattern, and he knew there's another day coming. There's a future. So what does Paul encourage us to do? So fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but what is unseen. And fix our eyes is a statement of conscious choice. It's not that we just randomly are clicking around on our TV and just stop at a random place. But it is make a choice of what we will choose to see. And to remember that on all of our days. You know, there's somebody that when I came to this church back in 2004, he was on staff, staff member here. And we worked together for several years. 
about three months ago, um, well, when he left the staff, we would get together for lunch on occasion and just enjoy chatting. Three months ago, he was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And things didn't turn out well. And last night, he passed away. And I got a text from his wife at 11.35 that I saw early this morning. And I love her words. And again, I would ask you, what does she know? She said, Mike is free. He is home. Are those nice things that we say to each other when times are really hard? Or just like Paul, is that anchored in real events in this world of ours? That the story is not over. Here's something we like to say around here, and I think it is so true and important for us to remember in times of struggle and suffering. If it hasn't ended in joy, it hadn't ended. And it's still happening. The journey continues. The story is to be continued. But God will have the final word. One more football analogy on this day here. And maybe I know we've been talking about some heavy stuff here. So this is from 2022. Third quarter score, 33 to nothing. And I'll just mention any fans of these teams in the room. Neither one are in the playoffs. Okay, so pipe down. Um, but 33 to nothing. The final score, 39 to 36. Biggest comeback in playoff history or in football, NFL history. You know what that helps us understand? That maybe the halftime score or somewhere along there, that score is one of the most meaningless statistics in all of sports. You know what matters? The final score. And if it hasn't ended in joy, it hasn't ended. And we might be in the first quarter, we might be in the third quarter, but with God, we win. We win because he won. And he will have the final word. Would you bow your heads together with me? God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for your great power, your great love, your great grace to us. And God, in a world that so often is broken and leaves us asking why and how could this be, and God, would you take this away? God, may we anchor our hope to a God who has the final word. And God, in this world, help us to know that it's inevitable that we'll have hard days. Help us to see beyond the pain of the moment, the struggle of the moment, the difficulty of the moment. And God, help us to know that our hope is an ultimate and eternal hope that is found in you. And thank you for the love you give to us. Thank you for the difference you make to us. Thank you that we can offer words of hope even when someone that we care about passes away. And that's not nice words to soften the blow. It's something anchored in the reality of a God who left heaven came to earth and made a way for us to belong to you. And so thank you for so much that you have accomplished on our behalf. May our hope ultimately be in you. And we ask and pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you found this sermon meaningful, please subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Your support helps us reach more people and spread the word. Stay connected with us throughout the week by following us on social media at Washington Heights Church on Facebook and Instagram and by visiting our website at whc.faith. For more information and additional resources, check out the podcast description below. Thank you for joining us. See you next week.